Good day and uh, welcome uh, everyone uh, here in South Africa and all around the world. Um, my name is uh, Guillaume Sinclair. I'm a senior economist at uh, Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies, TIPS, uh, and it will be my pleasure to be your facilitator uh, for today's uh, webinar. For those who don't know uh, yet TIPS and stumbled uh, upon this event, uh, we are uh, an economic policy research institute based in South Africa. And our mandate uh, is to support the development of public policy in support of economic development, social progress, and environmental sustainability. We engage in, in policy research, in capacity building, as well as in uh, knowledge dissemination and dialogue. So today's event really uh, falls squarely at the intersection of our work. Uh, it, it focuses on better understanding the concept uh, and the agenda behind a just transition to an inclusive and green economy in South Africa. It builds on previous events that we have in the past few months, uh, notably in July and in September. Uh, if you have missed those events, uh, do not worry. Uh, the recordings are available and they were included in the invites and uh, you can check them out on the TIPS website uh, as well. So why today's dialogue? Um, the concept of a just transition globally and in South Africa has repeatedly, repeatedly risen to prominence. Uh, even though it's an old concept uh, emanating from the 1970s, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, it has taken center stage in, in the country, definitely. It is understood to be uh, an economy-wide and society-wide transformation, which aims to ensure that the transition to a green economy um, remains just and inclusive and actually empowers uh, and ideally actually even make sure that vulnerable stakeholders are better off through this transformation. We are talking of low-income communities, workers, small businesses, um, and uh, any other uh, vulnerable uh, stakeholders. <clears throat> While it is um, understood to be an economy-wide and society-wide transformation, the debate in South Africa is heavily focused on the coal value chain. Let me state up front that it shouldn't overshadow discussions in other sectors and other value chains. But there is a reason why discussions are focusing on the coal value chain. Uh, the reason being primarily because uh, this is the value chain that is uh, at the heart of uh, the South Africa's energy system. It is the value chain that uh, generate the most greenhouse gas emissions uh, in, in the country. And it is the value chain that is likely to go through dramatic transformation in the shortest uh, time frame compared to other potential sector uh, in the country. So today, uh, we set ourselves to back some of the evidence around the transition of the coal value chain in South Africa. Um, and we have four uh, experts with us uh, today to unpack all of the nitty gritties and different aspects and perspective around the just transition and the coal value chain. Um, from um, the work that was done around vulnerability assessments um, to understanding uh, the perspective from workers to understanding the perspective from more communities and, and, and grassroots uh, dynamics to what is uh, required to finance or what are the costs, you know, really uh, of that transition, uh, early estimates of that. So we set for a very exciting time. Um, we've got two hours upon, upon ourselves. Um, I really want to, to encourage you to ask questions uh, through the chat box. Uh, if you do that, Please make sure that you uh, click before to all panelists and attendees uh, so that you can really ask questions uh, and as well as through the Q&A box that you find at the bottom uh, center of your screen. 
Um, we'll give uh, each of our panelists uh, a moment to uh, make introductory remarks and, and then engage in a more uh, interactive uh, discussions. Without further ado, um, let me hand over to, to our first uh, panelist, um, my colleague, uh, Mohamed Patel, uh, who is an economist uh, at TIPS. Uh, he was actually the uh, lead author uh, of the National Employment Vulnerability Assessment and the Sector Jobs Resilience Plan for the Cold Value Chain, uh, which TIPS conducted for uh, the Department of uh, Environment, Forestry and Fisheries, and the Department of Trade, Industry, and Competition. Uh, Mohamed, over to you. You have uh, about uh, 15 minutes. Uh, so thanks, Galo, for that uh, very uh, kind introduction. Uh, and yeah, the, the idea with this presentation is to run through some of the main uh, insights and findings from um, the NIVA, so the National Employment uh, Vulnerability Assessment, as well as the Sector Jobs uh, Resilient Plan work that we did on the core value chain. So I, I guess a useful starting point is to is to start with some context. You know why, um, you, how important is coal for for South Africa? And uh, the answer is that, uh, as I'm sure most of us know, it's quite an important uh, value chain. Um, it underlies our entire manufacturing in the sense that. Um, our electricity is predominantly uh, fueled by coal. It also has important linkages into the chemicals value chain where uh, Sasol's uh, petrochemical complex feeds a number of downstream industries, most notably plastics, fertilizers, and explosives. From an employment perspective, uh, directly uh, the value chain employs around 120,000 uh, people. Uh, most of it's concentrated at the coal mining stage uh, but also including ESCOM generation, as well as SASO. Um, coal exports are an important uh, revenue earner for the country, uh, where approximately 50% of, uh, of, the, of the coal mining sector revenues come from exports. And that's to a handful of uh, countries, uh, mainly India, uh, Pakistan, and South Korea. When we talk about the coal value chain in South Africa, it's largely an Mpumalanga story. Um, so coal value chain activities are concentrated in, in, in a handful of municipalities, uh, mainly Emalashleni uh, and, and, and Steve Schwete. Um, so so the, this uh, figure just gives an illustration of the, of the value chain that we put together to show some of the main uh, linkages. So on the left, we have uh, coal mining. And then um, you know there's the export line, which uh, Coal is beneficiated and travels uh, through the Transnet uh, Railway through the uh, to the Richards Bay Coal Terminal and then is destined for, for international markets. Domestically, um, uh, coal serves as an input into ESCOM's power generation activities, uh, which creates electricity that's then uh, fed to municipalities as well as to energy intensive uh, users. Uh, coal is also a vital input into metals refining, into, into metals refining and uh, feeds into Sasol's uh, CTL complex, um, which then uh, produces liquid fuels, uh, as well as uh, a number of uh, base and performance chemicals. So, um, so what's the problem? And, and the problem is uh, essentially we, we, we're, in a, we're in a global context that's uh, increasingly turning away from coal. So, out of the spectrum of fossil fuels, coal is the most uh, carbon intensive when combusted. Uh, and uh, the domestic industry faces a number of risks. Uh, domestically, uh, there's uh, punitive legislation in the form of carbon taxes and carbon budgets. We know IRP 29 uh, has kind of set the departure from, from coal towards a greater renewables intensity. From a global perspective, um, we see that after the Paris Agreement, uh, countries are increasingly um, engaging in climate legislation uh, away from coal. And uh, that impacts South Africa through coal trade uh, to, to some of our main coal partners, as well as through punitive trade measures uh, like uh, border carbon adjustments, for example, which are meant to start in the EU by 2023. So uh, there's a strong likelihood that other trade partners are going to follow suit and, and this, 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 uh, 
this places a lot of risks on, on, the, on the future growth and profitability of, of the core value chain. So because of the highly concentrated nature of, uh, of the value chain, these impacts uh, stand to be quite acute on the, on the local municipalities uh, in Mpumalanga. So municipal municipalities like MLF Laney and Steve Shwete. And the result is that once we start seeing declines uh, in, 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 in coal revenues, the firms start to pull out uh, of the region. And because these uh, municipalities are so highly reliant on, on coal value chain activities, this is going to leave a huge gap. Um, the result is that vulnerable stakeholders in these regions like uh, workers, uh, small businesses that either directly feed into the value chain or indirectly feed into the value chain and communities uh, are left devastated by the impact. So from a developmental point of view, this is a key concern uh, for South Africa, given our high levels of unemployment, uh, inequality and poverty. So uh, a key part of the analysis was the vulnerability assessment. And the idea was to try and understand where exactly the pain points are in the value chain uh, and which municipalities stand to be affected, how workers fare in terms of their resources, uh, as well as an, an identification of where the main vulnerable groups are. Um, so uh, in the figure on the screen, uh, we have uh, gross value add uh, segmentation for some of these local municipalities, as well as for comparison, uh, GVA for South Africa and the rest of the provinces. And what's clear here is that the, some of these municipalities are highly invested uh, in coal value chain activity. If we take uh, MLS Lenny, for example, 44% of, of GVA uh, is accounted for by the coal value chain. We see similar dynamics when it comes to employment and that's expected. Um, uh, there's a high uh, level of uh, employment in the coal value chain in, uh, in, in just these four municipalities. In fact, these four municipalities account for bulk of the coal uh, employment uh, in the country. Then when we, when we look at workers in the value chain, we wanted to look at uh, different elements. So we look at financial capital, we look at human capital, and we look at social capital. Uh, so starting off with financial capital, in the coal value chain, the median wage is, 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 is higher than, than the rest of the formal economy. And that's an important uh, point to bear in mind. Uh, amongst the coal value chain, so coal mining, uh, electricity generation, and and, and, and chemicals production, we see that the lowest median wage um, is at the coal mining stage. This is not uh, an anomaly. Uh, we see this kind of, uh, you know, coal miners earning a relatively higher wage than the rest of the formal economy. We see that feature throughout the world uh, in, in coal mining. So it's not a unique feature to South Africa. Um, but it is an important point to bear in mind, uh, especially when we take into account the level of education at the coal mining stage, because it has an impact on um, future employment and the expectations of, of displaced workers when they try to seek, uh, when they try to seek new employment. Uh, other measures of, um, of uh, financial capital that we looked at were you know, the prevalence of retirement contributions as well as UIF contributions. And what we found in the analysis was that uh, the coal value chain overall has a higher uh, uh, level of or higher prevalence of retirement contributions as well as UIF contributions compared to the rest to the rest uh, to the rest of the formal economy. Uh, the second insight was from a human capital point of view, and here we looked at the skills profile of uh, of uh, of the coal value chain as well as the level of education that occurs in the value chain, and then we contrast that to the rest of the formal economy. And in that analysis, what we found was that particularly at the, particularly at the coal mining stage, um, most, uh, most workers are either unskilled or semi-skilled. Uh, in fact, it's, it's, there's a higher prevalence of semi-skilled. So um, when we contrast that to the rest of the formal economy, we see that uh, the rest of the form formal economy has more uh, of, a, of a skilled worker emphasis uh, relative to the coal value chain. So when we put this picture together, what we see is that um, coal miners are low to semi-skilled and they paid relatively uh, better than the rest of the economy. When we look at the level of education, most, uh, most uh, coal miners have a matric or less. 
Um, so that has important implications. Also, when we think about uh, some of the policies to to, to deal with uh, with transition, such as uh, active uh, labor market policies and reskilling and retraining. Uh, from a social capital point of view, and this is not unexpected as well, there's a high degree of unionization throughout the value chain, particularly, again, at the coal mining stage, um, partly uh, responsible for the, for the, for the annual uh, wage increases that we see uh, in mining. Uh, employees in the coal value chain also were found to fare better off with respect to uh, the prevalence of a permanent position uh, the, the prevalence of a written contract, as well as um, uh, different types of leave. So this annual paid leave, as well as uh, paternity and, and maternity leave. One, one group that we narrowed in on, uh, so, so important, a cornerstone of the just transition uh, framework is that the process is inclusive. Uh, and when processes are not inclusive, they can result in, in key uh, political economy tensions. So uh, as part of the inclusive process, a group that we focused on were coal truckers. Uh, and these coal truckers are, are, are small in, in number, but have substantial political clout. And uh, they're highly vulnerable as they exclusively invested in coal. Um, so we went out to, to MLF Laney and, and met with, with, the, with the small uh, coal truckers and they number approximately 200. Um, the total employment uh, amongst these truckers is about 2,000 to 4,000 uh, workers and they earn approximately the same amount as coal miners, uh, between 11 and 12,000 rand a month. They, this group is highly vulnerable because they exclusively transport coal. So, they, so the infrastructure is not used to transport other types of goods. Um, the ability to transition um, to, to transport of other goods is, is limited uh, without financial assistance. Uh, there are some possibilities, uh, you know, to transport uh, other types of, uh, other types of um, mining uh, products or uh, in the transport of uh, groceries or perhaps liquid fuels, but these require some, some, degree, uh, some degree of investment. So uh, this particular group is important to, to take account of when, when thinking about uh, transitioning away uh, from coal. Another group are communities and, and, and because of the graphical concentration, um, once, um, once coal is removed from, from these economies, a huge uh, vacant gap who, who, who will be left there. It's particularly a problem in some cases where um, you know, private firms actually uh, uh, provide municipal services. So in the case of when we visited the ESCOM Hendrina power station, at Hendrina, um, the power station also pays for, for landfill costs and sanitation costs as well. So once that station is decommissioned, the, the question arises who's going to provide um, you know, these essential municipal services where the municipality doesn't have uh, have uh, sufficient resources. Another point to bear in mind is that uh, to the extent possible, power stations uh, tend to, uh, you know, employ from the locality, but there are in certain cases, uh, workers that are in other provinces. So once these, um, once these facilities are decommissioned and closed down, then we likely to see migration into other provinces and then uh, potentially placing a burden on services in those provinces as well. Uh, so based on the vulnerability assessment, we, uh, we put together uh, a number of uh, insights proposals uh, for, for action to move, uh, to move uh, you know, the support forward. Um, one, of the, one of the key, um, one of the key um, proposals was to, to, to develop a, a, you know, appropriate information capacity. And throughout the world where, where, where there's, uh, you know, countries going through coal transitions, there's usually a dedicated entity that's, that's tasked with uh, a, a, number of, uh, a, a number of responsibilities. You know, it's monitoring the trends. Uh, we know that the, the outlook on coal is, is uh, you know, coal markets are in a state of flux. We see funding being withdrawn. Uh, you know, it's quite a, a tumultuous uh, environment. 
So there needs to be dedicated capacity monitoring these trends and, 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 and adapting accordingly. At the same time, there needs to be a dedicated institution that drives the, the implementation measures. So this is one of the, one of the proposals that comes out of the analysis. Uh, at the time, it was envisioned that the, the, the P4C or the Presidential Climate Change Coordinating Committee uh, could be a likely home for this uh, mandate. Uh, but uh, yeah, but th this was one of the main proposals that came out. Uh, a second insight that came from the research was that uh, social and labor plans that are meant to be formulated before uh, you know any any resources can be mined uh, have not been delivering uh, in, uh, on on the on their mandate or their aims. Um, so you know, some of the main criticisms uh, have been that you know they're not democratic, and we know that a central tenet of the just transition is that. Uh, the process is inclusive and it's giving agency to the most vulnerable uh, in chartering their, 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 their futures. So, um, so it's important for the SLPs to be revisited uh, and for them to be more democratic. Um, there also needs to be a greater emphasis on monitoring that the SLPs are actually delivering, uh, you know, the, the benefits that, uh, that these communities need. Uh, another important part is economic diversification, and here, once coal is removed from these municipalities, there need to be other economic opportunities. Uh, so, you know, a dedicated entity needs to monitor these, uh, you know, the, the, the possibility for new activities. In the study, we did investigate some possibilities, but we didn't go to the level of an actual feasibility study. And some of the opportunities that emerged were in three main areas, you know, in mining rehabilitation, in other countries, mining rehabilitation has been used as a tool for economic diversification. Uh, in Mpumalanga, there's a large degree of, of agriculture. In fact, 30% of our maize in the country comes from, from Mpumalanga. So there's a potential for rehabilitating land for agriculture. There's also some synergies with the circular economy in the sense that spent ash from the power stations and from satellite facilities can be used uh, to beneficiate uh, and increase the fertilizer value of the land. Uh, renewable energy is another option, but not uh, not the only option. Uh, I see Gelo is telling me that my time is out, so I'm going to round up quickly. Um, and uh, and cold waste beneficiation is the final option. Uh, another important uh, part is the uh, it's the use usefulness of ALM policies. Here, each municipality uh, needs to be assessed in terms of the age profile of workers. Uh, and then it can be decided whether some workers are given early retirements or workers are given skills uh, and training. And finally, there's an urgent need for, for social protection in, in some of these communities. And uh, the, the dedicated structure is well placed to, to, to drive uh, some of these interventions. So I'm going to stop there and uh, yeah, happy to look at the questions and, and, and move, on to, move on to the other research inputs. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Mohammed. I think that was a really brilliant uh, summary of the, the NEVA and the SDRP. Um, there have been a, a, couple of, a, a couple of questions that, that popped in uh, in the chat as well, the Q&A. Um, just maybe as a way of introduction of that, just before I hand over to you, Mohammed, um, on, on those questions. When we looked at the at the NIVA and the SGRP, we, we covered uh, five value chains. Um, so the coal value chain was only one of the five that, that we covered. Uh, we also specifically looked at the metals value chain. So kind of other kind of mining to metals, uh, to beneficiation of metals. We looked at uh, road, road transport. Um, so consider the liquid fuel uh, linkages with road transport, uh, as well as just transportation services. Uh, we looked at uh, agriculture value chains uh, and looked both at uh, kind of farming as well as kind of livestock. Um, and we looked at uh, tourism. So we uh, looked at quite a, a palette of, of value chains. Um, and of course, we acknowledge that there are a number of linkages between, between those value chains. Uh, and that, that starts to answer a little bit, uh, I think, Al's question around, you know, did we look at the direct use of coal and industry? Um, so you know, we did that as well, for example, looking at metals specifically. Um, but uh, we also looked at it from, from the coal value chain perspective, and I'll let uh, you, Marvin, answer that one. And, and, and then the second question, uh, uh, also from, from Aralda, I think, um, 
is what's the level of um, investigation that we did uh, with, with respect sorry, to skills. Um, so, you know, in the graph, we, we broke that down to semi-skilled, low-skilled, and, and skilled. Um, but, but I believe we had, we had uh, somewhat more detailed information uh, available. Um, so maybe if you can uh, expand on those two questions briefly. Um, and uh, before you just do that, I just want to encourage everyone to, to ask questions uh, as you go uh, through the Q&A or, uh, or the chat box. Yeah. Mohamed, um, a quick uh, answer to those yeah. two questions. So in terms of coal use, you know, we were guided by the major consumers of coal. Uh, uh, so that's for electricity generation, the metals, uh, the export line, as well as SASO. Um, it did come up, um, it did come up in, in, in engagements that, you know, there's some consumers that use, uh, you know, coal directly for domestic purposes and consumption. Unfortunately, examining that is kind of beyond the scope of the project, but um, uh, yeah, it is an important, uh, it is an important um, uh, factor to take into account, especially, um, you know, when you look at illegal mining and, and, and you know, um, communities trying to, to to access uh, residual uh, residual coal, um, yeah. From uh, from the for the skills question, um, have you examined skills at a more granular level? Um, to the extent that we could, with uh, you know, with uh, with some of the major stakeholders, like uh, for example, when we visited uh, Andrina, um, we had uh, data on you know. Uh, from the from the station managers uh, specifically on the skill set as well as you know what those skills actually involve um, and uh, to the extent that we had access to that information we included it in uh, in our report yeah great thanks um, I think that's uh, that that's that's good I mean the data is all available uh, in in the actual documents as well um, which uh, which are accessible and that uh, we'll share with you um, after the event, in any case, just uh, for ease of uh, of access. Um, let's um, let's turn to to our, our second uh, second input. I'm very pleased to to welcome uh, to to the stage uh, Pulare. Uh, Pulare is a senior researcher at uh, the Sam uh, Trambani Research Institute, known as uh, Satri, um, which is. Uh, known as the research arm of uh, the National Union of Mine Workers, NUM, and uh, she's conducted extensive research on, uh, on the transition and the impact on workers, and she'll be presenting uh, on the uh, protection of workers' interest uh, with regard to various possible uh, energy mix choices uh, in, uh, in, in South Africa. Uh, Pulane, uh, the floor is yours. My name is Pulani. I am from um, an organization called Semtamani Research Institute. It is um, a research uh, institute established by National Union of Mine Workers and Mine Workers Investment Trust. So today I will be presenting to you a research that we did 2017-18 um, regarding energy mix choices and how it will affect uh, workers. So uh, the presentation will just, I'll just introduce this, the, uh, set the scene and, and the background of, of the research um, and go straight to the findings and then invite everybody for, for the discussions. So as we know, we have all been experiencing uh, some energy crisis um, lately characterized by power shortages, load shedding, you know, in fact, for some time now, and the IRP 22 10 to 30 was a response uh, to, to that crisis. And it aimed to ensure that we, 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 are, we get secure and sustainable, sustainable provision of energy. Because this is a living document, it's been changing based on several factors, including supply and demand of energy. Um, and it was last, uh, I think, uh, updated uh, last year. But basically, it recommends uh, diversifying energy or, 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 or power resources and broadening electrical electricity supply technologies to include um, 
gas, biomass, and renewables. Um, and as, as I said, currently, you know, currently you know, South African energy mix is dominated by, by coal, and that's also contributing to uh, carbon dioxide emissions. And this proposed uh, mix is meant um, to help the country move away from relying to, uh, on coal, but also to increase uh, power generation uh, in the next few decades. So when we move to, from, from coal, uh, the idea is that we do so uh, with uh, taking into consideration issues of equity and justice, especially uh, for workers. But I mean, we all are aware that uh, moving from, uh, I mean, to a low carbon economy will fundamentally change the structure of the common economy and impact on the working class. And, and the NUM as a union that is organizing both the coal and the energy sector uh, is aware that its members will highly be impacted by this shift or by, by, by this transition. Um, and for, for the NOM, it's, it's very important that we acknowledge and we, we, we honor the fact that the, our economy was built on the backs of coal mine workers. And I think we can't stress enough that as we transition, uh, we need not leave behind coal, coal workers and we need not leave behind communities that uh, historically were dependent on coal industry for livelihoods. So for, for us as a union, uh, Rather than just debating on whether coal industry is good for, or bad for the environment, uh, we, we've really started uh, to speak uh, in economic terms, you know, looking towards job creation, looking towards what economic op opportunities are there for the future, uh, particularly for, for, for people that are going to be affected by this uh, transition. And we need to start talking about making sure that people are not only reliant on one type of economic opportunity uh, so that uh, when we transition, we're not transitioning also to another singular opportunity. People need to have a range of options as we see that um, relying on one um, opportunity is becoming problematic in, in any case. So uh, the understanding within the union is that there needs to be a plan on how, first of all, to manage potential losses um, and also how to transition uh, the coal sector into other secure employments, into other new industries uh, and the mining communities as well so that they become independent uh, when we remove the coal. So because of this, um, the, the, the union mandated statutory uh, together with FES, uh, we were working with them as a partner in this project um, to conduct this research uh, on how the transition will affect uh, uh, workers. And so the research was intended, in, intended to generate, uh, to help them generate an informed position of whether they support or not support particular forms of, of uh, energy source. Uh, and I must say previously, the, the, the union had, had taken um, a decision not to include uh, or not to support the inclusion of nuclear in the energy mix. But as we went into this uh, um, research, they then also instructed us to look into the implications of nuclear energy uh, uh, generation uh, to workers. And, and now they're starting to review, review that decision of whether or not to include um, uh, nuclear energy in the energy mix. Uh, questions are being raised now, uh, whether it, it could be uh, an answer to the energy crisis that we have and, and employment challenges uh, that South Africa is facing at the moment. So yeah, Specifically, also there's been an ongo ongoing debate in the in the union on how renewables, uh, you know, with the introduction of um, uh, IPPs, there was a hullabaloo and fights about it. How the renewables uh, affects or, or creates uh, new jobs, as well as uh, if they could help absorb P 
people that stand to lose or be affected when we transition. Uh, okay, I think that's just it's the, the background of where the, the research came um, from. So in terms of what we did, or, I mean, the objectives of the research, we, we really honestly wanted to document the nature of the jobs that are created in different types of energy sources, to also identify if there are any specific skills for each source that can, can, can be transferred, if the training that needs to happen, if people need to be absorbed in, in various uh, um, uh, sectors, and also to establish uh, the extent in which we are ready to, to, to transition. Uh, so phase one, what we did was to have a symposium uh, or a conference, if, if you like, of NUM uh, leaders nationally and, and, and workers uh, in various interest groups. Uh, we invited lots of researchers from different organizations and research institutions to come and, and do a presentation to that. But the, the intent of that symposium was to actually get um, views of the workers on how they are affected or they, they, uh, they see the transitioning affecting them. Uh, and so out of that uh, symposium, questions that came where how do we ensure that uh, we transition the workforce to, to well-paying and sustainable employment? Um, how do we also make sure that we don't leave the communities uh, behind? Um, and, and because there was so many uh, questions that uh, workers were not satisfied with the, the, the NUM Central Committee then instructed that they needed more evidence-based research. Uh, and then they, they wanted us to go to the field and actually compare, see, because there were issues about the number of jobs being inflated uh, in other uh, power resources. So, so they wanted us to go to the field and actually compare uh, and see the employment profile in this in these power stations to see the skills out there uh, and to see if they, they these are comparable to what uh, the coal sector is offering at the moment. So that prompted our phase two, uh, which is field visits. I've, I've only shown nuclear and renewables because with the coal, NUM has uh, ample uh, number of members from the coal sector. So it's easy to get uh, uh, an indication of, of the number of, of, of work, work and workers that are uh, in, in, the, in that industry. So we visited uh, nuclear uh, Quebec, we went to the Niasa Nexa, and then with the renewables, we went to Key Solar Plant Station. It's in North, Northern Cape, Hopefield in Western Cape, and now Power Green, it's in Johannesburg. Saratech also, they deal with the training of um, uh, skills and qualifications for, for renewables. Uh, so that's what we did. And when we met with uh, some community members in our, in our visits to the, to the power stations. Uh, so in terms of the research findings, I've decided to just um, group them in these four aspects before, because those were uh, the, the issues that the, the union was interested in. Permanent job creations, skills shortages, if there are any uh, transferable skill, skill sets, if there are any economic opportunities that uh, either the community or the coal miners that will be displaced can uh, partake in. So if you see a, a, a green smile, it means it was a good uh, outcome. Uh, an orange or red, not, not a good one. And then four, it's, it's not bad, but it's not, I mean blue, it's not bad, but it's not uh, satisfactory. So in terms of job creation, we concluded that nuclear has uh, or showed a good potential for job, permanent job creation as compared to, to, to renewables. And I'll, I'll, I'll get, I'll get uh, to discuss those in, in the next slides. And in terms of skills shortages, uh, like both these sectors are highly skilled sectors. And as we are, we do not have those kind of skills. Uh, transfer, transferable skill sets, 
from a coal miner to a nuclear specialist or whatever, not good. Uh, and then to renewables, it, it can be done. And then economic opportunities we found that nuclear, perhaps it's, all, it's because of also that it's been uh, nuclear power in, in South Africa has been here for some time, for quite some time actually, as compared to the renewable industry, which is fairly new. So yes. And then, like I said, uh, most of why we were not happy with the with the jobs that are created in the in the renewables um, is that most of them are or people reported them to be there whilst there was construction or building that was happening uh, in the initial phase of the project. The same goes with uh, uh, nuclear. I would think that in any project during that phase, they, they are uh, jobs. But I mean by their nature, uh, jobs related to constructions uh, by definition are temporary uh, and they, they end when that particular phase uh, uh, ends. And most, most community members would complain that the foreign people would come to, and, and then build. And then once the, the construction is, is, is completed, they then hire uh, their own foreign brothers to, to do the operation and maintenance. And then, there was, then it's also not surprising that um, during the operation and maintenance, uh, a lot of people would then report no jobs or lesser, uh, fewer jobs, both in, in nuclear and renewables. But in all honesty, in the, renew, in the nuclear plant, that's why I, I keep saying perhaps it's because of the time, um, the resources that have went through the industry over the years, the, the number of people that are, are employed there Visibly, they are much more compared to, to the number of people that work in the in the renewables power stations. And then we also had an issue, uh, uh, or a problem with the way the number or the jobs are counted uh, in the renewables, uh, because in the renewables you have uh, job years. Um, what we concluded was job work years may be an excellent tool to calculate the amount of work needed to complete a particular project, um, you know, such as measuring uh, how long a particular task will, will take. Um, but we found them to be inflecting the actual number or maybe how we know it of, of jobs that are created. For, for, for an instance, with the job creation, I mean, uh, job year, a job year in a, in a one year of one person in a construction can be many job years. I, I mean, <laughs> you see, it's even confusing when I explain it to myself. So it, in, in a one year of a construction, A person can have a construction job year can last five years in five years. Yeah. So we found that confusing. It's even still confusing me now. All I know is in a year, it's one job year, two years, two job years. Whereas for us, we want a permanent job, we want somebody to be employed for a longer period, somebody to have benefits as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an employee, um, to have leave days, to have provident fund. This, this does not happen in construction. And then the issue with the skills short, shortages. We also found that there's a huge gap in terms of what the companies required and what the labor market offered in terms of the skills and also what the communities had. Uh, as an example, then you would have uh, a post metric being qualification being a, an entry level requirement in the renewables, as well as in the nu nuclear energy. And in many cases, this prevented even the community members to enter into those um, um, uh, industries. So you can imagine the, the, the people who work in a low skilled jobs 
especially in the mining subsector, you know, the coal mining subsector with limited skills or no or lower skills and no education at all. And for us, these are the majority of the NUM, NUM uh, members. Uh, and, and we felt like these are the people that are going to be impacted heavily by, by this uh, transition. Um, another thing that we noticed is in the operation and the maintenance um, phase, those, those jobs are highly skilled. Um, unlike your operator in the coal mine, uh, who is either semi-skilled and sometimes not skilled at all. And the perception is that when the coal miners get uh, displaced, they will be automatically accepted in, uh, or absorbed in these jobs. But we find no evidence of that uh, for both the, the, the nuclear and the renewable energy. Those are the skills requirements that we sort of put together when we're going there based on, on, on our research. Um, and you, as you can see, your typical mine worker, who at this point, based on our other research, majority of them don't even have metric. Last year, we we're doing a research on challenges facing women. And we could not conclude that research alone because of the, the questions questionnaires that we have sent out, we, people could not understand or, and write or respond to them. So we had to actually be there and carry out um, verbal interviews for, for the members. So when you look at, at the, even the, the first phase of the value chain, like uh, my previous comrades were saying, in terms of the equipment and manufacturing uh, and distribution of, of either the products uh, for the renewables and for the nuclear. It is very difficult to have your typical mine worker uh, in those uh, uh, jobs or skill set. Um, maybe they can be there as technicians, but not majority of them. The same thing goes through, through to the project development, the construction and installation, as well as the main uh, operations and, and maintenance. Uh, as, as you will remember, I said one of the things that we wanted to find out was to see if there are any skills that can be um, transferred from the coal sector to, to either the, the renewable or, or the nuclear uh, energy. And interestingly, we found evidence that coal uh, miners have some skill sets that can be used, uh, especially in the renewable uh, as compared to the, to the, to the, to the nuclear. Um, and those skill set they range from mechanical, um, electrical expertise, all the way to their confidence in working in a highly technical fit, field with a strong issue of safety, like they are very, very careful and uh, articulate uh, uh, in how they carry their work because their work by its nature requires to, them to be so. However, low skilled workers, particularly the ones in the mining subsector, coal sector, especially the ones that are represented by the uh, National Union of Mine Workers with limited or, uh, or no education whatsoever, cannot and find it difficult to use the skills because they actually do not have the, the qualifications requ required for a person to join this industries. And, and, and training on alone, which, which is uh, one of the issues that we also um, identified when we were at Saratech. Training, training is good and it's, it's vital for, 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 for this transition to happen, but training alone will not be able to solve the problem. For example, you can train like 100 people to be wind turbine technicians, solar panel, what technicians, but if you only have six jobs in a plant 
or if you only have one in a plant, you still have trained people who are unemployed, which is the biggest issue that we have when we, we, we visited um, the, the renewable power plants. They weren't any of the people working there. You would find their plant, there's a, it's even controlled remotely, maybe in, 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 in Spain, and not even in South Africa, there's only one person there, the security. Uh, and that is another thing also that we found in, 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 in renewables, that most of those jobs are not only temporary, but also they have nothing to do with energy production. So I think what is, what is important is, 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 is um, for the government to have a strategy on how it's going to address the issue of skills constraints. Uh, that may ha may hamper people or stop people from uh, being part of these new sectors. So another thing is is um, the economic op opportunities. We, our research found that um, there was an effort that the uh, nuclear industry had, had made in terms of maximizing um, local industrialization especially economic clustering of nuclear manufacturing in South Africa. For example, at Next, Next they had established a, a, an arm, a commercial arm, I think it's called an NTP, that delivers nuclear medicine to more than 60 countries. And I think in that year, they were reporting that they had made over 1 billion um, of revenue. Uh, and they also supply all the South African nuclear medicine requirements, both to the public and to the private healthcare center. All these are manufactured uh, locally. With the renewables, you find that investment and manufacturing companies that were created uh, were mostly short-term and, and, and unstable, and that they could not grow to become national or globally competitive um, during that time. However, renewable energy, provides opportunities um, for manufacturing because most of the manufacturing companies that they had uh, opened, of course, they were closed because of the issues with the IPPs, but they reported that they, they had employed quite a, a significant number of, of uh, workers there, which were low skilled. So I think in conclusion, I'll, I'll, I'll just say majority of the jobs uh, in renewables and nuclear are of high skilled labor. And then we suggested that um, the location of these plants, both either renewable or, on, or nuclear should be in areas where people are going to lose jobs. And then the, the, the recommendations are that um, for renewables to work, it must have favorable uh, conditions, such as promoting locally owned renewables, such as reskilling and training people for jobs, not for unemployment, and then prioritizing communities. I thank you. Thanks so much, Kulani, uh, for, for your presentation. Uh, it uh, certainly sparked a lot of discussion uh, and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of questions uh, in, in the chat box, as well as in the Q&A. Um, I just want to throw a couple of questions that you uh, know, and hopefully we can we can tackle a lot more of them in the in the, in the discussion a bit later. Um, maybe just two two questions. Uh, the first one is is um, you know what are what are the unions uh, doing um, to start sort of reskilling and retraining workers or exploring new opportunities or. Um, there is a clear evidence that um, uh, you know there's going to be a need for reskilling and, and alternative livelihood for workers. So uh, you know it's one thing to to have that evidence, but it's another to to really kind of uh, do something about it. So interested to know what the unions or you know, are, are busy with. Um, and then a, a second question, um, importantly, is. Sort of where you got the the data for for your for your findings uh, from? Um, there's a lot of studies uh, domestically, but also uh, at a global level 
that show the uh, significant job creation potential of renewable energy specifically. Um, so your conclusions seem to, to be uh, somewhat at board with, with some of those studies. So uh, interesting to, to end back uh, maybe some of, some of the evidence uh, in, in that respect. There's many other questions which I'll, I'll take up uh, in a discussion, but maybe you, you can just uh, give some thought to those first two, uh, two prompts, Pulan. So your first question is what the union is doing regarding um, rescaling the way comes. Yes. So, so I'll, I'll talk on behalf of, of what the NUM is doing. NUM is at the moment um, uh, involved in trying to train mine workers to become artisans, um, to go into the issues of agriculture. I, I'm very glad because I think Mahomet in, in, in his presentation, he talked about land rehabilitation for agricultural use. Uh, so, so those are the uh, some of the um, suggestions that we do for, for, for our members that we are doing uh, in terms of trying to get them um, employed in other sectors. So we, we've actually opened a new academy, it's called Artisan Academy, that um, deals with that. And the issue of where we got our data from uh, because there are other opportunities. I think this, this is the thing. I've had, I've had this so many times that the, the renewables offers opportunities, but that's why we went and visited the, this um, power plants to see tangible uh, jobs. But if you go back, I said, there's evidence that renewables can provide uh, manufacturing or can offer uh, uh, manufacturing gains. It's just probably because of what was happening with the IPPs. And a lot of people confuse IPPs with uh, uh, the union's uh, position on renewables. You, the union is and is supporting the renewables, not the IPPs. I don't know if I've, I've answered your question, Scala. No, for, and also maybe just just to revolve on that. I mean, there was another question um, uh, in, in in the Q and A, which did you look at uh, other opportunities? You know, uh, because of course, it's not because you're working in in, in a coal fire power plant today or in coal mining today that you have to be working in energy tomorrow. You know, you could be doing uh, mm. other things. Mm. You know, mm. um, so did you look at other sectors? Uh, maybe. Yes, we do look at, at other sectors. Remember, I said at the moment we are focusing on agriculture, we are focusing on artisan, and many other things that uh, we're trying to train people. But I think people forget that majority of the mine workers are unskilled, not unskilled, but low skilled. So you have to start at for example, even the metric people do not have that you require people, uh, uh, workers to join those industries. But that doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that uh, we, we are saying people can be artisans, we're saying people can be manufacturers, we're saying people can be uh, into, go into, into agriculture. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get them there. Uh, thanks, thanks, Polani. Um, there's a lot more questions in the in the Q and A uh, as well as in the, the chat box. You know, you, you please do do have a look uh, and and try and you know you can engage and, and answer some of those questions uh, in writing. Um, but we'll try to go back to 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 many of those questions uh, in in the discussion uh, a bit later on. Uh, thanks, Polani. Um, let's not let's not turn to our, our third uh, third input uh, for today. Um, very pleased to, to welcome Michelle uh, to, to, the, to the center stage. Um, Michelle is a senior tech, uh, technical advisor uh, at uh, GIZ, the, the German development agency, um, working on green economy and skills development specifically. Uh, but she will present some work that, uh, that she did, uh, I guess, somewhat before GIZ uh, life um, around the cost of, of mitigating um, coal labor losses in, in, in South Africa. Um, 
So a very crucial, crucial uh, topic to understand what's what's at stake, but also how much how much do we need uh, in terms of of dealing with with the problem. Um, so Michelle, uh, very keen to hear your input. Uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Gaylor, for the opportunity to join the panelists. I think I'm going to add to some of the contradictions and debates around the skills area, but I don't think that that's a bad thing. So I think everyone's familiar with the, the pathway that we're on um, really in terms of the IRP looking at and we're committed to a decarbonization pathway which hinges on the decommissioning of coal and, and up, uptake of renewable energy. So the research that we did looked at what the cost of a just transition from coal would be and what the how we could transform the South African political economy and um, accelerate this transition. So what the dynamics would be um, in this case. So um, the, the methodology that we use to calculate the cost of a just transition was adapted from a model by Robert Pollan and Brian Kalashi. Um, and it really looks at four areas, which is which is compensation, retraining, relocation, and um, rehabilitation or, or, or regional development. And just as a caveat, what I'd like to say is that, you know, these are obviously not the cost, the only costs involved in calculating what the cost of a just transition would be. It excludes the costs of a just transition commission, strengthening um, institutions, especially from the bottom up, dialogue forums that are crucial uh, you know, accommodation and um, stipends that go with retraining. Uh, and then also the, co you know, the cost of transitioning to more uh, uh, sectors that need more support, like agriculture, where salaries are a lot lower. So, and, and then the important area of pension. So these are the four areas we looked at, but obviously one needs to really look at the bigger picture and needs uh, input from the industry to be able to inform that. So I'm gonna roll quite quickly because I'd like to get through as much as possible, but our data really covered a number of um, specific areas like the age of uh, core workers, skills levels, education, salary, et cetera. And then also looked at pension data and we drew from national labor data, sent a survey to coal companies, looked at the social and labor plans that are very outdated and um, also looked at the mine workers pension fund report. And then what we were trying to do was look at a 20-year cost framework that uh, protects workers through them retiring naturally. And, that, and, and this is what we call attrition, uh, which is a, a protective and a supportive way to look at workers exiting from the, from the industry and, um, and what the relationship between attrition and contraction rates are. So um, this, is, this was our point of departure. Um, you'll see in row I at the bottom, if one is aiming for a very high protective, um, high attrition rate of 82%, so in other words, trying to protect 80% of workers, your corresponding contraction rate would then be 43%. So production, uh, what we mean by that is production and the number of, of em employees lost um, over time. And then once you've, once you've started working with those um, those parameters, then you can see that the number of jobs that are lost over the 20 year transition is 35,000, the average job loss per year. And then you take the number of workers between 45 and 65, which is 35% that retire naturally, you're left with a, a small number, smaller number of workers um, per year that would uh, reach 65. So you only would then take care of or need to support 6,600 um, workers over the 20 year period. But then when we correlated that to the IRP um, de decommissioning scenario, which has a contraction rate of 75%, the proportionate attrition rate would then be 46%. And you're looking at a lot more job losses over the 20 year transition, which is 61,000. And um, the number of workers that you need to take care of in total is 32,000. So, so these, we, we, we haven't established the, the agreed contraction rate and the agreed attrition rate. So these were really scenarios that we were looking at, but it's a starting point. And we used this, um, this table to start calculating the costs. So if you, um, if you look at the cost of compensation, how we calculated that, 
um, that was really looking at what a coal worker's salary, average salary is minus the green economy salary. So the gap would be 3,000 Rand, which has over, taken over 12 months. So obviously, this is, there is no average green economy salary. But what we did was we took, um, we used studies to say what would the potential future industries be? Um, and then we took those South African corresponding average salaries, and then we um, multiplied it to be able to calculate um, the, the cost of compensation, which then worked out to be um, over five years, um, one to two billion. So um, then we looked at retraining costs, and we know that 16% of coal workers have a degree. We also know or recognize that the future, future skills, future workers need to be a lot more highly skilled. So we, we made an assumption that if one uh, had aimed to educate uh, workers as much as possible and looked at 54% trying to get degrees and then 20% getting a vocational qualification and 10% possibly um, solar uh, wind turbine um, qualification, then the the cost for 6,600 workers would then be 621 million or 31 million per annum. So um, my, my point of view around this retraining cost is it's not necessarily, you know, this is obviously a one-stop intervention, but, it, but the workers aren't the only people one should consider. You should consider future generations and the children of workers that are in the, in um, Pumalanga. So, um, you know, Something like a vocational university or a um, that's linked to employment, you know, would be a more innovative approach. But um, you know, this was a starting point to look at what uh, the skills levels are and um, what the cost of educating that many workers would be. So, if we look at the coal workers' education profile, um, we we could see from the data that 16% have. Uh, uh, post-school qualifications, 84% have matric. But then to, to, as I said, to add some spice and feel to the fire around uh, the skills levels, the discussions I had with the Colliery Training Center was that most coal workers have matric and that this is guaranteed through the, the uh, recruitment process that coal um, companies follow. And more than more than that, they also have matric with maths and science as far as possible. Now, this um, this would appear then to uh, mean that we have workers that are highly train trainable, and I think especially uh, in regard to artisanal um, careers. So, so I think that this was a this was a good uh, discovery and insight that came out of the research. We then also looked at relocation costs that were based on one month's rent travels travel costs and, um, you know, sundries like leases, uh, you know, where, where relevant, um, and looked at labor sending areas. So where do workers come from that haven't lived in Mpumalanga all along? And, and you're looking at uh, many of the, the provinces, surrounding provinces, and what the percentages of workers are. And this, this data comes out of the social and labor plans. And um, it's an important consideration when you look at workers that might want to, you know, migrate home or um, need a cost that needs to be factored in when they look at working elsewhere to possibly be closer to their, their extended families. Um, regional development was, was quite a tricky one in rehabilitation, just because there's more research that's needed to calculate this cost accurately. Um, and we also need to distinguish between rehabilitation, land reclamation, and regional development as part of this um, process. So the Estimate, estimate that we've included is based on special economic development zones in South Africa, and, and then we calculated an amount that we thought, um, you know, government could contribute to in terms of support, which was a 4 billion rand um, investment based on um, the SEZs, and then also um, looking at business, I think it would li like, be likely that businesses would then come to the party and then contribute and, and there'd be some kind of a public-private um, partnership. So um, just so in terms of uh, a supportive attrition based just, just transition, um, you know, you, you're likely looking at some kind of uh, income, you, you, you need to look at some kind of income protection for co uh, coal workers, but then also you'd need some form of policy sequencing that integrates industrial uh, or uh, development and um, 
yeah, labor as well as economic development. So, so this wider um, area that needs to be covered around regional development would then need some form of policies um, that, that secure it um, from a broader perspective. So what this research really has shown that, um, that the model can be developed and extended, that uh, you need innovative institutional financial uh, arrangements that are facilitated by government and high level of buy-in from leadership uh, is important to unlock um, a just transition and make sure that that these plans would likely to be um, secured. So, um, and we looked at transitions um, quite broadly um, across various countries, primarily global north, um, but you know, obviously one needs to look at it from a South African perspective as well. So, um, yeah, I think a just transition really is gonna have associated costs, but we, we need to plan for it and um, it relies on collaboration and it's an important part uh, juncture in our, in our um, from a timing point of view to start doing that impl planning, impl planning implementation now. So I think maybe what I'd like to expand on um, to respond to Polanyi as well is some of the data that we applied that we got from the social and labor plans and from the coal mines that responded. Um, we did occupational profiling, um, so split the, the, the workers' profiles across various occupations and then mapped it um, with in the same way that other studies have done to see how skills transfer across various stages of renewable energy um, occupation profiles. And the, the, the occupational category of plant, plant, and, machine, plant and machine operations and um, technical um, are the two categories that are the biggest, and that those two are the most transferable all the way across um, in various stages, you know, whether it's construction, maintenance, um, or, or on all the stages of um, development across solar and wind. So, um, and that's just based on the, the subcategories of skills. So, you know, I think that there would be a lot more skills transferability. You know, the big question is uh, how will workers be supported given the difference in salary? And, and as Polanyi said, um, how, how those, those jobs would be secured over time. Um, you know, with the with there being a lot more continuity for renewable energy projects, so so that was also an interesting application of the data. Thanks, Galo. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle. I think that's uh, yeah, really great, great presentation, uh, and really timely to to really understand uh, the the direct implication. Um, uh, there's a couple, a couple of questions uh, coming coming through. Um, so, um, and, and I guess I'll add one, one of my own uh, to to, um, <coughs> to do that. But um, uh, okay, I guess the first one is is uh, slightly more ph ph philosophical. But uh, what do you mean by by costing critical juncture? Um, um, that's one from David. So, yeah, what do you mean by costing critical juncture? Uh, does this mean that uh, there's a critical moment for allocating public finance to just transition? Um, so, you know, do you think that the budget requirements can be realized politically? Um, and, and I guess we, it, it ties in a way as well as kind of the question from, from Lorraine. You, know. um, you, you have uh, initial estimates of 6 to 16 billion Rand, basically. Um, so, uh, we need to start asking ourselves, of course, what we, can we can we refine that estimate? But then, you know, it gives us a ballpark to work with. Um, so, how do we finance this? You know, um, is there any willingness for industry to 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 finance it? Um, have you done any work looking at potential sources of finance for this, or you know, kind of how that would that would work? Yeah, I think those those questions kind of speak to each other. Yeah. So, I think just to come back to David's question on the critical juncture, I think you know we. We can plan for a just transition or not. You know, we can we can um, we we have the opportunity to address uh, uh, the structural inequalities, and you know that's that's uh, an important part of a just transition. Uh, and 
there is a lot of interest and to the extent that there's high level buy-in, we would uh, be able to look at really redesigning um, uh, our economy in a sense and uh, prioritizing communities that uh, have been neglected in the past. So um, the critical juncture from, from a just transition perspective is, you know, if this opportunity is lost, you know, if we don't design to the needs of those communities while we while there is so much lining up to give us the opportunity to do that. And, and um, not just lining up from a South African perspective, but globally, you know, the, the emissions that we transmit affect everyone. Uh, so, you know, this is, I think, forcing us to to, to take decisions and to um, take initiative and, and steps towards something. So, so that's what I meant about the, the critical juncture. Um, just in terms of the financing, you know, that's obviously the, the question um, for a lot, a lot of people are asking. And you know, I, I don't think there would any way other than it being some form of a financing agreement that is obviously not in place yet, but that needs to be conceptualized uh, with uh, on, a, on, a, on quite a strategic level involving uh, a lot of parties and you know we need to look at all the costs quite quite carefully so you know whether it's development finance or some kind of a green green deal or deal that's constructed uh, as part of this um, economic restructuring with with uh, with many with the right people in mind in terms of the beneficiaries um, the opportunity is there, and um, you know I think that that's that's what we are. That, that that's who the people who we are in this room is. We're looking at the des that design, and um, we've we've got this chance to to address the real problems from a South African perspective, and in relation to I think some of the challenges that that um, Pulani shared, and I'm sure David will be sharing as well. Is how do we how do we address the community? How do we address the safety and health issues? How do we address the challenge of employment? And how do we how do we look at jobs and, and, and our economy? Because jobs do come out of the economy and are important. I think in the last um, week or two, we've had some you know, really tragic incidents with activists um, that were impacted by exactly that, the challenge of jobs versus uh, community and the homes that we live in. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's in sharp focus right now. Thanks, thanks, Michelle. Um, before I, I move on, I just one, one technical question for you uh, on, on, what you, on what you presented. So I do wanna throw it to you. Oh, I just, it just disappeared now for some reason out of my screen. Um, but it was it was to do with the attrition rate uh, and and why the I attrition rate was uh, was steeper than the IR, uh, IRP decommissioning um, uh, scenario. Um, can you maybe just re-explain what what goes beyond behind the kind of attrition rate calculation and how it differs from the the IRP decommissioning scenario? Yeah. So as the contraction rate goes up then the, the attrition rate goes down. So you're protecting fewer workers. Um, but then the, but the costs are still high because there are a lot of workers that um, you know, are obviously in the system that need to be supported. So um, that's, that's why the, the costs go up. Um, I don't know if that, if that explains it to you. So I found back the question as why the attrition rate scenario should have a slower contraction than the RRP decommissioning scenario. Yeah, so the contraction rate, you know, it's it's really up to us to write that um, and determine that and negotiate that and argue for um, argue for a higher a high con as high a contraction rate as possible. I think from a from from many perspectives. However, you need to provide the support for workers. So so this model is not really about. Um, a specific contraction rate or a specific attrition rate, but rather that you apply attrition to be able to support workers as far as possible. And for those that you're not able to support through attrition, that you're, you're able to support them through finding jobs. So the, 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 high, the percentage of 80% was really based on the US model that I used, but they, for their coal um, application to their coal sector, they, 
they even uh, dropped it down to 60%. So you could have a lower attrition rate um, as long as you're supporting those workers on their journey to transition. And, and, then, and then, you know, be closer to the IOP uh, in January. But that you still use attrition to be able to um, have workers retire and, you know, not have to absorb those costs. Great, thanks. Thanks, Michelle. Hopefully that, thanks, that does yeah. it. Uh, um, great, well then, then let's move on to our, our, uh, our next input for, for this morning. I'm um, very pleased to, to welcome uh, David. Uh, David is a researcher at, at uh, Groundwork. Uh, Groundwork is an environmental justice organization, uh, for those who haven't heard, uh, heard of it. Uh, he's done a lot of research uh, with civil society organization, uh, looking at environment, education, career information, labor, rural development, and, and he'll present on the politics of the just transition uh, in, in South Africa, uh, particularly from, I guess, a, a community or sort of grassroots, grassroots level. Um, so, oh, David, uh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Jado. Okay, so uh, what we actually looked at was uh, not the ideal transition, but the transition that we see happening. Um, the title down to zero is kind of has different meanings. It's uh, on the one hand where we need to go to in terms of uh, carbon emissions and emissions of SO2 and nitrogen oxides, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's also what is kind of happening around the energy sector. The image there is a, um, is a conveyor belt at Majuba, which uh, this was taken last year by, um, by somebody and uh, it, it, it went, did the rounds on, on, uh, on social media. Um, and there's a third meeting, meaning of down to zero, which is taken from a song by Joe Norma Trading. And that song is about heartbreak. Um, so we think that the transition is underway. Um, Michelle talked about we had the opportunity for a planned transition. Now, what we're seeing is an unplanned, uneven, highly unjust transition. Um, and that we think has been going on since kind of uh, around the middle 2000s or so. Um, we locate that not only as an impact of what ha is happening at ESCOM, but what is ha happening in the broader minerals energy complex. So we take ESCOM to be in the middle of that complex, uh, a key institution in that complex. Um, it built a directed development in this country on the basis of cheap and dirty and energy based on cheap labor. So in that respect, it's a credit to the unions that uh, the, the, that mine worker um, wages are, are above that of um, surrounding of other industries. Um, and it produced a highly concentrated and pollution intensive economy. Um, where we see things going, if this economy is sustained is with declining employment into the future and, uh, and and, and uh, dirtier energy, basically. Um, so not only ESCOM, the ESCOM model was basically very large power stations to supply a very big load demand. So very big energy intensive uh, industries. Um, what's happening, what, what started happening from about 2010 or so, uh, or 2011, was that not only were the prices, the tariffs escalating on Eskom side, but demand was collapsing in the uh, in the rest of the MEC, which uh, we, we, which um, consumes a great deal of Eskom's energy, uh, and so so you had a breakdown on on different levels of the energy system as a whole, or rather fragmentation. Um, we also obviously saw corruption as part of that story of the of the of the breakdowns at ESCOM. Um, 
it didn't start with the Zuma presidency. It also didn't start with the ANC. It's been baked into the system since, uh, um, since the very start of the minerals energy complex. It was baked into the system with the dispossession of people to coerce them into work, that kind of stuff. And um, it is also in the legal and illegal offshoring of profits um, that, uh, that that is ongoing to this day. Um, so we think that uh, corruption has been very significant over the last uh, over the last decade in the um, in, uh, and and notably involving ESCOM, obviously, and that's got something to do with the collapse of uh, of of that that we are witnessing or the transition that we are witnessing. ESCOM, one should say, was sort of like chum in the water to the sharks of corruption. Uh, its, own uh, its own managers were going after it. Transnational corporations were going after it. Uh, the Guptas obviously were going after it. And on the high felt, there's high degree of, uh, of, of criminality going on as well as people did things like, um, you know, roll up kilometers long of, well, first cut. Uh, conveyor belts which take the coal from the from the mine to to the power stations and then roll up kilometers of uh, of of, uh, uh, of 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 the belts and uh, drive away with them so that, that that level of it's it's kind of like um you know uh, um, taking everything away as as uh, as things start to collapse so the high felt became a very dangerous terrain as well. Um, uh, workers in that process have been tossed aside. Wherever the um, wherever the forms of protection start to fail. So uh, at Optimum Mine, where well, it's actually a couple of mines which are satellites to Optimum, uh, the workers were simply abandoned. Uh, during the course of uh, 20, towards the end of 2018. Um, I think there were about 200 of those workers who, who, um, who no longer had jobs. They actually carried on working for about six weeks after their last payment. Um, so they were owed salaries. Basically, that was part of the Optimum story. It was part of the Gupta story. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details, but at the end of the day, they felt abandoned. They felt abandoned by their own union. They felt abandoned indeed by their own branch at Optimum. Uh, they looked, uh, and, and there, there, there was a total collapse of trust. I think the absence of trust is one of the, uh, is, is one of the defining features of uh, the transition that we actually see. Nobody trusts the bosses. Uh, um, a lot of people with, within ESCOM, ESCOM has a big job around, around rebuilding uh, trust. Um, there's very little trust between community and the authorities, between community and government. Um, almost nobody believes what government says anymore. Um, and then even within the labor force, even within the, uh, the organized forms of the labor force, a lot of people, uh, workers that we spoke to, um, don't trust their unions, don't trust their own shop stewards. So uh, um, there's a, a, a very severe trust deficit. Obviously that won't apply to everybody, um, but uh, it's, it's, it's fairly widespread. I want to just um, quickly go to what is one of the underlying reasons for needing a just transition that is, uh, climate change. This is in Baira uh, after uh, Cyclone Idai. Um, there were a lot of people killed there um, by Idai. Fewer people were killed by Kenneth, which went further north. But the interesting thing about Kenneth was that that was the second typhoon in, uh, in, in within a period of six weeks, and that is unprecedented in, in Mozambique. So uh, Byra has been hit by um, cyclones before. 
Um, Capa Delgado has not been hit by cyclones before. And uh, that is, I don't know if my cursor shows here. No, I don't think so. Um, oh, that bit just opposite uh, the north end of, of uh, Madagascar is, is Capa Delgado. The reason for the typhoons you see in the coloring of the sea here, um, that shows temperature anomalies. In other words, the red bits are much hotter than they should be. Yeah, um, the blue bits are more or less at uh, at 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 where they were historically. Um, the interesting thing here, from a from a, a a different kind of climate perspective, is that that area of Mozambique is where the big new gas finds are being exploited by Shell at the moment, and people are being dispossessed um, of access to fishing grounds, and uh, they've been shunted off their own lands, et cetera, et cetera. So that stuff is happening at the moment. In, 20, <clears throat> in 2018, there are a number of international reports coming out um, from the IPCC, uh, from IPBES, which is the Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, and from the Lancet on Health and Climate Change. All of them emphasize that we need to change the system, not the climate. As the climate activists have previously said, unfortunately, um, uh, the climate is already changing. So it's a little bit late to say not the climate, but uh, if we don't uh, change the system very fast, uh, they, then things will only get worse from here on. Yeah. Um, so these are quotes from um, from the special report on 1.5. First, that climate change will make poverty and inequality worse, but quote pathways limiting global warming to 1.5 percent would need. Um, sorry. The picture of myself is 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 kind of obscuring the um, uh, is obscuring the quote. Um, pathways limiting global warming to one point five percent would require rapid and far-reaching transitions in energy, land, urban infrastructure, and industrial systems. So I think those those, those are some of the challenges that face us. But what we mean by such transitions is uh, part of the question, I think. Such changes facilitate ambitious mitigation and adaptation in conjunction with poverty eradication and inequalities. And then this quote is the one that I really want to emphasize. Social justice and equity are core aspects of climate resilient development pathways that aim to limit global warming to 1.5. So it's not merely incidental. Um, Key messages from them that we need to start now. The transition uh, has to start happening on a global scale now. Justice is essential, not incidental. Restoring Earth is necessary for mitigation as much for adaptation. Uh, GDP growth is not compatible with a real response to the global ecological crisis. It is absolutely extraordinary to have an international a publication published within the framework of an intergovernmental panel uh, to actually come to that conclusion. What they aren't allowed to talk about is capitalism, so we'll do it for them. You can't have capitalism without growth. So basically, the system that we need to change is that economic system. In our report, we looked at vulnerable systems. Um, because uh, we are looking at uh, what is likely to break down under the impacts of climate change and of other um, uh, of, of, of other uh, ecological breakdowns. So one of the things that we need to stress about the um, uh, uh, about the transition is and about the reasons for needing a transition is it's not only about the climate. Counting carbon is not going to do it alone, although that might be necessary too. We also face uh, species extinction. We face ocean acidification. Uh, geochemical cycles um, are, are going out of kilter. Um, the pollution from aerosols, particularly ordinary pollution that we have, uh, 
um, sulfur, black carbon, et cetera. Um, also impact on climate change, but uh, impact on us first. Uh, plastic and chemical pollution is absolutely everywhere now. Um, land conversion, uh, a, 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 a different, I, I mentioned Joan Armour Trading at the moment, so Joni Mitchell talk, uh, sang about paving paradise and putting up a parking lot. Um, Freshwater stress uh, for 5 billion people in this decade and ozone layers, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that we'd like to emphasize out of that is that when it comes to COVID, the experience on the ground does not merely foreshadow climate change. It is an instance of the disruptions that follow from wide, wide scale ecological disturbance, including climate change. And I think it's probably interesting that uh, people like um, Lord Stern didn't actually factor that in to uh, when, when, when they were looking at the um, economic impacts of, of climate change, um, pretty much in isolation. So uh, the vulnerable systems, what are the systems that are going to break down? Our water system is already pretty broken down. And that goes along with the sewage systems as well in lots of municipalities. Our food system is on the edge. Um, if you think about a food, food system that is supposed to provide to the population as a whole, well, ours doesn't. There are millions of people who are malnourished one way or another. Um, there are lots of children who are stunted. Ocean fisheries are under threat as well, and that also has implications, obviously, for food. The health system is uh, clearly struggling, and, uh, and one of the interesting things about the health system is that on the high felt, it doesn't actually cater to the high incidence of, uh, of, of that you get on the high felt. Um, and local government, uh, settlements are breaking down all over the place, and I'll just talk about that a little bit later on. Impacts of climate change. Uh, this you can take as settlements. Um, this is in Durban. The family there were actually killed in that mudslide. Um, so in the floods in Durban in, in 2019, I think it was. Um, and so, so that's, uh, um, you know, what, what, what it really shows is the way in which poor people are most vulnerable. So Abishlali Basam Jundola's comment on that was, to be poor in South Africa means that you must constantly live with fire, floods, and armed and violent evictions and disconnections. You can never really relax. There's constant worry and stress. There's no holiday in the shacks. Um, this is uh, Durban Harbour, plastic on the water immediately after those floods. The next day, it was sewage on the water. Um, part of the reason why the sewage plants broke down was because plastic got stuck in the pumps, but the sewage plant plants are breaking down anyway, even in a relatively well-resourced uh, municipality like, uh, like um, Teguin. This is the Katsi Dam. We avoided day zero in Cape Town. Think about day zero in a car tank. The water system is going to be put under dire stress by climate change. Um, and this was day zero in Graaf Renet. Uh, Graaf Renet ran out of water entirely. And one of the interesting things about that was that part of the response was the delivery of uh, bottled water to people. Basically, the municipality's boreholes uh, um, didn't get water to the end of the pipeline. And people at the end of the pipeline, of course, were poor people. But the people who delivered this water was a gift of the givers. Government was nowhere to be seen. So one of the one of, one of the extraordinary things about the transition that we are going on is the refusal of government to take responsibility at all sorts of different levels. Um, and that is a matter of, of, of great concern. Um, in 2015, 
climate is one of those levels. In 2015, South Africa was party to the African Ministerial Committee on Environment's call for a to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, activists at 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 a at a climate camp in Paris in uh, in 2015. Uh, said that they thought that uh, government should act as if they meant that. In 2019, the South African delegation was instructed that government had not decided that it should act on the basis of the IPCC 1.5 report. So the, these things are of great concern. If we are going to really address the, the, the consequences of the breakdown of ecological systems at a planetary and at a local level, we need to have um, we 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 need government to be taking responsibility and doing it and looking at these things very seriously. Just out of that, uh, um, just kind of three summary kinds of points here: um, not to transition results in the terminal injustice of mass death, basically. This year, the coronavirus has torpedoed economic growth. Um, we need to think about uh, the implications of ecological breakdown further down the road. We need a just transition for all. In 2011, COSATU produced a, uh, a, a just transition um, policy statement. It called for deep transformation, not just for uh, you know how many jobs are here or there, they said we need deep transformation in the economic system. Um, and as I've done earlier, they, they saw the system as being capitalism. And they said that we need something that uh, we, we need much deeper transformation than simply changing the energy technology. Um, we would add that we also need something that's actionable now. So that's uh, that, that's um, uh, what I'm going to go to now. And then there's the question of what of government? Uh, where is government? Um, will government really come through with, uh, with, with um, serious stuff? At the moment, it is very difficult to see that happening. Um, although we... Uh, do note that the Presidential um, Commission on, on Climate Change has, uh, well, the, the, the steps to putting that together have been taken. The, uh, just very quickly, the context of coal-affected communities. Very high unemployment, uh, over 40% in the townships of Emelisleni. Um, so uh, a little bit higher than the national average in a place like Emelislenia as a whole, but in the townships, you get, have over 40%, and of course, that's rocketed this year. Um, heavy pollution all around. Uh, I mentioned that a little bit earlier. It's not just climate. Um, so one of the effects of actually having a just transition is that the environment will stop being polluted. Um, in the way that it is polluted now. There'd be a lot of fixing up to do, and I'll come to that as well. Um, a lot of dirty tricks, conflicts. Uh, on the high fault in 2019, there were uh, about a dozen coal trucks burnt, as well as the conveyor belt story that I told you about, um, uh, all sorts of other forms of violence on the high fault. And then on the coal fields more generally, um, you will all, I'm sure, be aware of the of of the assassination of of uh, Ma Fagila and Changas last week. Um, so, the 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 kinds of conflict that uh, that have attended the um, the 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 coal, uh, I th I think, pretty much throughout its history, the coal industry, but. Um, in the uh, chaotic transition, as we see at the moment, um, we think that that is intensifying. Um, so, uh, and, and then a third aspect is coal dependencies. Um, a lot of people who don't believe that uh, there is a life after coal 
who have not thought of a transition of any thought, sort, let alone a just transition. Um, and those include not only mine workers and power station workers, those include uh, street sellers and a lot of people who, uh, who, who are part of the informal economy around uh, in, in those areas. And many of whom, like the coal miners themselves, are actually migrants. Um, so what's to do? Rapidly reduce fossil fuel burning. Think about people's survival. We think that it comes down to this now. How are people actually going to survive in the communities, particularly those people who are more uh, vulnerable? And we think that democratic organization and common control of resources is, uh, is an essential part of that. Restoring earth, uh, restoring ecosystems, restoring ecosystem functionality, and including moving the way that uh, we produce food. Um, so, and, and including obviously the rehabilitation of lands that have been ruined by, by, um, by uh, coal mining. And then finally, there's a matter of uh, a different form of justice, and that is the climate debt, which is owed by the north to the south, but also to, by the rich to the poor within this country. Who got the profits from, uh, from uh, coal mining? Who got the profits from the cheap electricity that ESCOM has historically produced and who has made poor? Okay. David, can uh, you please wrap up? Uh, okay, how much time have I got? Am I at the end altogether? <laughs> yes, yes, you're way over time, but uh, if uh, you can wrap up in one minute, that'd okay. be great. <laughs> okay. okay, so very quickly, you'll see this on, on if you want to go to the PowerPoint. Um, this is the agenda for just transition from uh, by local community people, a new energy system, rehabilitate the mines, food sovereignty, uh, fix and reconstruct settlements, and that sewage running down the street in uh, Fossmans, which is in the Milchlany, that's rubbish on the side. Uh, transform education, introduce a basic income grant, think about the economy in a new way, a welfare as opposed to a growth economy, and then obviously open democracy, making demands of local government, et cetera, et cetera. So while we are dismayed by the responses that we get from government, it is not something that uh, people can afford to let go. We need to demand uh, um, accountability. and participation. Um, so I think I'll leave it there. Um, we need to break with this present system. We need to build social power. Um, we need to work for democracy and for increased community autonomy and recognize and confront regressive agendas of the rich and powerful, which are becoming increasingly evident at the moment. Thank you, Gail. Great, thanks so much. Uh... David. Um, of course, we'll make the presentations available, as I, as I said earlier, uh, in the chat box, so everyone will have uh, that available. Um, just maybe a couple, couple of uh, yeah, couple of questions uh, to, to throw away, I guess. Um, what do you think is uh, kind of the the way forward. Uh, there was a question uh, saying that your way forward seems very reliant on, on, on government leading the way. And, and you also show that there seems to be a lack of leadership in that respect. Um, so um, what do you see as the as the sort of way forward? Um, and, and I think it ties into to another question uh, around, I guess, a bit of a coalition or alliance between workers and communities that hasn't really materialized uh, to date, but uh, could contribute to the way forward. Um, so maybe you could expand a little bit on, the, on those two points. Yeah, we had very much like, we, we did have a dialogue with, um, between community and workers in 2019. Um, and uh, that, was, that was quite interesting. It also included the workers that I told, or, or people from the group that I told you about who had been uh, who, who had been um, abandoned at, uh, at Optimum. Um, the, uh, and, and there were local union officials there as well. Unfortunately, the NUMU uh, 
um, regional secretary wasn't able to stay for the full duration of the um, of, of the dialogue. Um, but uh, obviously, we'd like to see that uh, uh, more of such dialogues. Um, and it is interesting. All the unions, I think, have it in their resolutions that uh, the, the, that they want to create a united front at local level. Um, those kinds of resolutions, uh, but it seems to be quite difficult to actually do in practice. Um, but it is something that uh, community people, I think, are committed to. Um, are, are committed to, and we'd certainly like to see. Uh, the unions coming through. Um, one, one should just, uh, you know, workers are not actually the unions. They are the members of unions, et cetera, but it isn't always the case that, uh, the, the, that workers and union officials see as one. Um, so absolutely, that is something that needs to be worked on. The other issue with, uh, with, with government, I think, uh, communities need to be more active about demanding accountability from government. Uh, there are perhaps limitations to um, how far they can get that. Part of the problem, I think, is that uh, in uh, the late 90s, early 2000s, um, when government decided that, well, since gear actually, when government decided that, uh, that, that, that what it needed to do was to create a black business class, um, all the emphasis has been going on there. So almost everything in government starts getting outsourced. Lots of capacity in government was then lost. And then you also have multiple opportunities for corruption, which, uh, so, so that whole system of outsourcing we see as part of a of a real problem around um, how one goes forward, and we think a lot more of that should be insourced again, and that means a process of municipalities rebuilding uh, capacities which they have lost or developing with them where they didn't have them in the first place. Great, thanks, thanks, David. Um, I think that's that's uh, yeah, very very concrete. I think, uh, and I want at this point to uh, bring everyone uh, to the four uh, our, our four panelists uh, and give you the opportunity to to have a parting shot. Um, you know, one last one last comment, one last thought. Um, just to maybe start fleshing out um, what do you think is required to get. This transition going, you know, what would be kind of the first the first step to to get to that uh, direction? You know, not, not from a theoretical level, but very concretely, you know, what do you think would be uh, would be required uh, to to get that started? Um, so just very briefly, uh, in one minute, uh, Max, each of you can uh, just give me uh, your your parting shots. Um, uh, Mohamed, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, sure, Guido. So look, I think I, I think we. we so there's a lot of there's a lot of research activity, there's a lot of analysis that's been done. Uh, we still have some way to go in terms of you know actual projects and actual implementation. Um, so it just as a kind of quick uh, run through, you know, there's still a need for fully distilling uh, at a at a very granular level uh, all of the employment risks that we face and what the future plans for some of these uh, municipalities are going to be. There needs to be proper plans in place. There's also complexities around, you know, mobilizing the correct resources, the financial resources, whether it can be done domestically or whether there's a need for international uh, support as well. Um, and uh, yeah, this, this, we need a concrete plan and, and a way forward, you know. Um, hopefully with the, with the P4C, we could see some uh, uh, specific institution with dedicated capacity that can actually drive this uh, uh, pathway forward and uh, and yeah I guess at the end of the day it's not just about coal and energy it's it's there's other sectors that are going to face uh, similar risks in the future coming from from climate change direct and indirect impact so uh, those those are going to have to be responded to yes, thanks for it um, Pulani uh, what about you any last thoughts I think basically what transitioning to green economy to uh, take into account the importance of localizing production and manufacturing and taking into account people that will be affected by 
the transition. That's all. That's all. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> you know. And then yeah, of I'm... course I have a plan, but but uh, if you if you take views and issues of of people that are affected with you uh, with this transition at heart, then you're likely to come up with a better plan than when people suggest that oh no they will be retiring oh no don't try to find opportunities for them but it they are the ones that at the heart of it so for me we cannot do it without coal mine workers and their communities indeed thanks for that um michelle any last point <laughs> For me, the skills question is obviously always, uh, you know, close to my heart. So I think if we could create legacy sister legacy um, institutions through the challenge of uh, the skills transition, and I'm thinking here, yeah, I mentioned about the potential of a vocational university. So getting the TVET colleges in, involved, but then also the importance of high level buy-in and really for us to, to facilitate a just transition effectively. It's about the, the coordination, I think, on an institutional level. This is what um, this phase of the evolution of the just transition is saying to us. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's gone from a just transition to for workers to more wider, um, you know, looking at the climate, et cetera. But where we are now in the evolution of the just transition, it's, it's about coordinating institutions. And, and, and I think there's, you know, obviously unlocking the financing for it as well. I think that if we put our energy there, um, you know, it would be half the job done. Right, thank you. Uh, David, back to you for okay. our last well, point. <laughs> right. In part, I already kind of answered that question in terms of the need for dialogue, et cetera. Um, we think that that's very important. So we'd certainly support um, increased dialogue, particularly between, um, bet between workers and community who are at the wrong end of South Africa's highly unequal society. Um, so, uh, so, so that's one starting point. I'll come back to the issue of government. Part of the reason why we think that communities should be increasing their levels of autonomy, in other words, increasing the levels at which they can actually um, survive in the absence of coherent government is because we don't actually, we, we, we think people need to take um, account of the possibility that in fact, government won't become more responsive that it will become more corrupt, et cetera, et cetera, and that they need to be able to provide for themselves pretty much insofar as it's possible. Now, obviously that's not going to be, um, uh, you know, the, the, this isn't the sort of situation that when one would like to end with, but, uh, but it's a situation that people need to take seriously. And um, we also think that the higher degree of autonomy for local communities um, will, hopefully strengthen their bargaining position with, um, with government, et cetera, strengthen their capacity to hold government accountable. So we would see those two things working, were working kind of in combination. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is a frightening prospect that, that as the systems start collapsing under the impact of climate change, so the social systems, the governmental systems, the technical systems, et cetera, et cetera, also, um, start unraveling to put a slightly different meaning that uh, to the one that you gave to this series of seminars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, David. And thank you all. Uh, hopefully, we avoid the uh, gloom, uh, uh, gloom and gloom, and we try to um, have a, a, a just transition. Uh, or at least a fair transition than what we're onto at the moment. Um, but uh, that remains for me to, to thank everyone, thank our, our, our panelists, thank you so much for your time uh, and, and your contributions. Thank you everyone for attending uh, our event uh, this morning. Uh, one last announcement is to already put the date in your diary for our next webinar, which will be exactly in two weeks time. Uh, the invite should be out uh, today, um, where we'll have uh, inputs uh, from uh, Mandy Rembramos from ESCOM, uh, from uh, Richard As Asley from Project 90 by 2030, from uh, Ntabiseng um, 
Fola Koana uh, from Stellenbosch uh, University, as well from uh, Dominique Brown from uh, the Alternative Information and Development Center. We'll unpack a lot more uh, issues around energy access uh, and uh, electricity uh, supply uh, specifically. Uh, we hope you enjoyed uh, today's session and look forward to welcoming you uh, at our next event. Thank you so much and bye-bye. Thank you.